good. Welcome, everybody. Yeah, welcome, everybody that might be tuning in to the last one, the last teaching of Revelation. Uh, this, well, I start to say this year, but probably, who knows? Uh, I haven't taught it in about 19 years, so I guess the next time, the next time Jesus will have already come, probably by the time we get to it, and then we won't need it anymore. Um, so, but that'll be all right, too. That'll, that'll be fine. That'll be, that'll be fine. The urgency of everything is is right there. And uh, so I hope everybody's gotten what you need and that the Lord would be happy with what we've done and and uh, what we've looked at because he certainly gave us this word for a reason, you know. I mean, I know, and you'll see one of the verses that we look at tonight will be a, a verse that reminds us that time is short and that even though it's been um, basically 1,900 years or a little over 1,900 years since this word was given to John on the Isle of Patmos. This word, just by the way of remembrance for you, uh, was given about 90, about 90 A.D. So it, it, it was given before, before the first century. Shortly, Jesus, Jesus was most likely cru crucified somewhere around 30 3, 34, uh, 37, even as late A.D., because, you know, Jesus wasn't born at zero. I mean, we, we think, we kind of think that, and it doesn't really matter, really, because the fact that he was born is what's important, but he most likely was born about 3 B.C., because time changed, obviously, in, in recognition and honor of Christ, but um, it didn't change. It wasn't like he was born and then it was zero and then they started from there. It was after he was already uh, a mature adult and uh, performing miracles and being the son of God and all that, 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 that things happened like that. So uh, anyway, timing was not exact. Uh, but of course, we, we do know that uh, this, the book of Revelation was written about 90, in the near 90 and that uh, John was a very old man on the Isle of Patmos, out in the, out in the about thirty miles off the coastline, right there in the Aegean Sea, and and a, it was a Patmos was a basically a volcanic rock, is all it was. Had a little bit of had a little bit of stuff, but but the prisoners there were politi usually political prisoners, and they were. They had to work the, the the mines and different things. I mean, it was a hard life. It wasn't, I mean, this was not like some uh, minimum security federal pen that we have nowadays, you know, where you have TV and recreation and air conditioning and all that kind of stuff. It's, it was hard existence. And, and, uh, and John says a couple of things, I think, in these last few chapters that let you know a little bit about how he felt, uh, what he felt was going on. So anyway... We're going to uh, we're going to look at the last two chapters, chapter 21 and 22. And uh, I wrote and I read this because I was all fired up about this. If you, I'm still fired up from this morning. So, yes. <laughs> so I guess, you know, I, I just kind of stayed that way. But but well, thank you, Bill. I appreciate that. Um, our world we were talking about for those of you that are tuning in now and, and you don't have you, you know, weren't here before while we were gathering up. Uh, we were talking about global warming and the fallacy and myth and lunacy of all of that mess. The fact that we as human beings could have the audacity, and I mean pure unmitigated gall, to think that somehow we as worms could somehow manage to ruin God's world that we live in. Now, I'm not saying that we can't pollute a creek by our house by pouring things in it, or a river couldn't be polluted by, by an industry or anything like that. And I'm certainly not saying that I'm for any of that. I, but I'm just saying that uh, we're not going to kill this world, and we're not going to destroy it with global warming. The sun's not going to go out and this earth become a ball of ice. All of the catastrophic things that have been spoken and said throughout the existence of our lives, our lives, and many of us in here have been here, you know, 60 and 70 and, and even more years. And, and we've heard all of our life, all, every imaginable thing about 
what to be fearful of for the end of the world. I don't know about you guys, but when I was in elementary school and even junior high school, we got a little paper every week called the Weekly Reader. Do you get a Weekly Reader? And it always had a little science section in the Weekly Reader. And I can tell you for sure that when I was in the seventh grade, because I distinctly remember this. When I was in the seventh grade, because it scared me to death. It said that by the year 2000 or 2020 or whatever, the earth was going to be a ball of ice. Back then, they were talking about it being a ball of ice. Now they're talking about it being warm and heating up and the polar ice caps messing, melting and the polar bears floating around the world. And now they've gotten off that because the last 15 years, the world's been getting cooler again all of a sudden. Now they back on now now they just said, "Oh, it's just a climate change. Let's just call it climate change." So anytime the weather changes, it's global warming. Mm -hmm. And and it, and it's and it's all you people that drive SUVs and you, you you know, you live in houses that you have heat and it's coal power plants and blah blah blah. I mean, it's just ludicrous. And then one of the more ludicrous things. <laughs> I'm sorry I got on this, but I'm fixing to get off in just a second. But one of the most ludicrous of all is if you will just sign this accord and say we're going to participate with the rest of the world in, in taxing our people to death so that they don't enjoy the luxuries of life anymore, and that's going to fix it. That's going to fix it. And then you're going to have to pay money if you use too much carbon or produce too much carbon. You got a bunch of cows out in the field releasing cow gas or something. You farmers are going to have to pay for all that carbon dioxide going out, which we are carbon creatures. We are made out of carbon. Plants need carbon dioxide to properly grow. They, hey, look, let me tell you, you know, I said this morning, God's pretty smart. Well, let me tell you what, just an example on that. When we breathe, we breathe oxygen. When our body takes the oxygen, when we breathe out, whew, that's carbon dioxide. I just put some carbon dioxide on you. Well, all these green plants around here, their leaves take carbon dioxide because they like carbon dioxide and grow, and they produce oxygen that we need. So isn't it a wonderful place? I mean, God is so smart, man. I mean, we need their oxygen. They need our carbon dioxide. But somehow we are going to just, whoo, man, by spraying our hair with hairspray or letting a little Freon out or whatever, we're going to kill this world. I'm just telling you that it ain't happening. And, that's, uh, and that is blasphemy and lunacy to say that. And all it is is a bunch of people that don't want to serve God and accept God looking for some way to tax the rest of us and make us as miserable as they are. And that's pretty much what that mess boils down to. And God's going to say it tonight. In this, in this 21st chapter right here, he's going to tell you what's going to happen at the end of the world and the end of all things. And so let's just kind of jump in here. Here we go. Uh-oh, let me get this up here. Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and also there was no more sea. I, can th I think John had a smile on his face when he said that. I mean, isn't it funny? The only thing he tells us about the new heaven and the new earth is it, it doesn't have a sea. <laughs> no sea. I'm thinking John sitting there on the Isle of Patmos and nothing but sea all around him. He'd been out there for years, nothing but sea. Only thing he sees is volcanic rock and the sea around him and a few birds which he's already told us how he feels about the birds. They were with the demons back in the, in, the, in the Babylon city that fell, you know, in the ruins of the Babylon city. But now he says, look, all I can tell you is it's the grandest place on the face of God's earth. There was no more sea. That's all I can say. Not a drop of it. But, but just, I mean, in this first verse, he, th he says to us, all right, here's what God did. God created, it created everything new again. And it, and it had to be because everything had been defiled. And I know this sounds weird, but you've been with us the whole time. Uh, Satan's been everywhere. I mean, Satan, did, Satan had, had the freedom to go in and out of heaven. Right now, right now, as I'm talking to you, Satan is going in and out of heaven if he wants to. Because he's standing before the throne of God accusing us day and night. And that's still going on because uh, the rapture hadn't happened and none of the things in the book have happened. 
And so it's still business as usual. So the original heaven, the original earth, the original uh, hell, Sheol, Hades, all of those things, same as they have always been. So John says, first thing God does, after the great white throne, you remember in the last chapter we had all the lost of the world. We've had Satan being thrown into the lake of fire. We've had the, the Antichrist and the false prophet thrown into the lake of fire. I mean, it is, it is, it, it, there's no more evil. There's no more sin. There's no more of any. Satan is gone forever to be tormented and tortured day and night forever and ever along with everybody who has not, whose name was not written in the Lamb's book of life. And the first thing that happens after that is God says, all right, babe, we're going to make everything new. All of that that's been defiled by even the presence of that wicked demon, we're going to have to make new. So we got a new heaven. So everything that John has seen in the book of Revelation and that heaven that Jesus went to prepare a place for us, you know, in John 14, he said, in my Father's house are many mansions, and if it were not so, I would have told you, and I'd go to prepare a place for you. That's gone because that was part of the old heaven. They got a new heaven. We got a new earth because this earth was defiled with Satan. And, and the only thing we know about it so far is it doesn't have any sea. That's all, that's all we know about it. And so he's going to go and tell us some more now. Then I, John, of course, he's testifying to the fact that he's a witness, and he's saying, look, I'm, this is not something I heard. This is not something that I saw this. I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. So he's describing to us a, a new city of Jerusalem uh, that, that comes down and, and kind of hovers there. And, and I know, you know, before satellites existed and those kind of things. We just had to try to guess about what this thing was going to look like because we did, you know, to think, okay, we have a city that's coming down and it's like, it's like between heavens up here and earth is here and then here comes this city down and it's just kind of hovering right there. It's kind of like a, it's kind of like a capital city of the kingdom of God and, and the access, we, we will have access to the new Jerusalem and the in the new earth and the new heaven. And it's like we can be in any of those places. And we, we, we have the opportunity to move ebb and flow and move around. And, and this new Jerusalem was a, was a city that God created that, that, was, that, was beautiful, that was as beautiful as a bride that is adorned for a husband. And actually, you know, uh, the city, uh, some cities in the book of Revelation have already been associated with people. It's almost like... Um, it's like it's like we can we consider them together uh, like uh, the city Babylon. The city Babylon was described as a great whore that sat on the throne, you know, and she was and the city was destroyed. And it was it was not only the city but the spirit of the city and the spirit of that city was like the wicked uh, woman in in scarlet and purple that was you know the great prostitute in heaven. That was destroyed. So lots of times in the book of Revelation, you get cities associated with people, and, and this and the New Jerusalem is associated with the bride of Christ. So this is our city. This is this is a grand place. This is the place that you want to be. And so John says, Man, I saw it coming down out of heaven, and I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. And God himself will be with them and be their God. And so um, we're going to be blessed by the presence of God uh, in, the, in, the, in the fall, in the Garden of Eden, in the fall. God came out in the cool of the day and met with Adam and Eve. And then when man fell, uh, man lost the presence of God and no longer could dwell in the presence of God. Sin could not stand in the presence of God. But now only those whose names are, lamb, are written in the Lamb's book of life are there. And all of those that have been martyrs for the tribulation, the cause of Christ, all of those Old Testament saints whose faith was counted as righteousness, and now God is going to be there. He comes and he will dwell with us forever. And we're going to be able to delight in his presence and we're going to experience his presence. And I, and I love the way it said that. God, 
God and the tabernacle of God shall be with man. You know, the tabernacle is that, is that, that movable tent of the Old Testament. And, and the word tabernacle means to, to dwell with. If you camp out somewhere and you all camp together, the term that's used, it's an old term, but you tabernacled as a, as a verb. You, you tabernacled. Well, the tabernacle of the God in the wilderness was where man met with God. You remember Moses, it traveled with Moses, and it had a holy of holies. It had the Ark of the Covenant. It had the brazen altar. It had an outer court and an inner court and an outermost court. It had a place where you came through on the Day of Atonement to sacrifice. It had the altar of incense and the lamp and, and, the, and, the, and the, la the, the light that was in the, in the uh, outermost court. It had a, an altar of incense, and it had the Holy of Holies and the Ark of the Covenant with the angels in it and the... Holy of Holy, the priest went in once a year. That was the tabernacle. Well, we don't need a tabernacle anymore because now it's not just the, whole, the high priest that goes in once a year that comes into the presence of God. We live in the presence of God. And the tabernacle of God is with men. I, 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 love, I love, and he will dwell with them and they shall be his people and he himself will be their God. And he'll dwell with us. It, it, we won't be going through any kind of ecclesiastical order whatsoever. There won't be any hierarchies that we have to go to like God's in the big house and only a few uh, Jehovah Witnesses that have sold enough magazines can go to the big house. And no, we're going to be there and God's going to be with us and we're going to be his people and God shall wipe away every tear from their eyes. I, I wondered about that. I wondered about what that really, what that means. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. Because for many of us, we will have been in heaven a long time. I mean, there have been a lot of people that have loved the Lord, have known the Lord. I mean, Billy Graham's there. You know, Dwight Moody's there. Billy Sunday's there. A lot of the great, uh, a lot of the great saints of God, Old Testament saints of God will be there by this time. And all the tribulation saints, they'll be there. All of us have been raptured, we'll be there. And, and we still have tears in our eyes? I mean, that's just kind of mysterious to me. But I'll tell you what I think about it. i tell you what kind of the... Con well, it could, could very well be. But let me tell you what I think this means or, or how this happened. All right. Note, I mean, it says there's no more death, there's no more sorrow, there's no more crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things are passed away. All right. Now, I think what that, that phrase, and God shall wipe away every tear from their eyes, means this. Corinthians, the book of 1 Corinthians, tell us in chapter 13 that now we look through a glass darkly, but then we're going to see him face to face. And when we see him face to face, we will know as we are known. Implying that what God knows about us now, when we see him face to face, we're going to know what he knows. So I, I'm thinking wiping all the tears from our eyes is a phrase that expresses the fact that when we get here, we will no longer misunderstand Pain, suffering, death, uh, misery, sorrow. Um, you know, so many times, so many times when we're, when we're, when we're miserable with, with suffering, our big question and we're crying and weeping through it is, why, God? Why? Uh, you know, and, we, and, and why did it have to happen? Why did we have to lose that loved one? Why? You know, I mean, that's our big, it's a torture to us, and, and we don't know why. And we ask God why, and he never tells us why. Right here, we, we know why. All of a sudden now, we don't, we don't have that pain any longer. We don't have that uncertainty any longer. We don't have that lack of knowledge, that lack of, of knowing God's purpose and God's why God did it and what it was for and, and how to understand it and what it was about. And, 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 and in other words, I think when we get here that... that we're going to know as we're known, and it's going to answer a lot of questions, and it's, going, and it's going to dry up the tears of our life. We no longer 
will weep over things like that because we'll have God's perfect knowledge about everything that's happened, why it's happened, what it happened, where it's happened, and, uh, and our pains and our fears will be gone. Now, go ahead, Bill. Right. And it's a release for you. Right. That I think kind of gave us that. Because I, I have armor just exploded in crazy weather like we were more than once. Right. So it's sometimes from being hurt. You know. Right. And I and uh, when you read that you think about well, we won't need that function right. anymore. Because there won't be any of that. Right. Hurt, won't be no hurt, no pain, no sorrow, no death. It's Right. It's to cry. It's to release pain. Right. Right. Well, it. Right. It certainly don't. Yeah. It cert. I mean, cause every all the stuff that we cry over is probably in that list right, right there. No death. No sorrow. No crying. No pain. No for, for all the former things that passed away. Go ahead, Rick. Could very well be. Right. Yeah. Right. Would be gone. gone you know, and, you, you, and I got you, and and I've thought about that often, and I know that's been somewhat of the explanation about that. God shall wipe away all tears from our eyes. For many years, I mean, if you've if you've re really ever thought about that, or you've heard it, or you've heard somebody preach it, or read it when, or say it at a funeral, or whatever, you've heard it. In the context you've heard it in, it, I know we've we've probably all tried to imagine what that would mean. I mean, and and why God would need to do that for us, because we're in heaven, and it's like we're going to have tears in heaven. Kind of like that doesn't seem to match up with our our view or our thoughts about heaven, that when we get to heaven, we'll be blessed. We'll be in a happy place of paradise, a land of blessing. But so we, we're, we're trying to imagine why we would need to have tears wiped and how God would, would do that. And, and, you know, the only one of the things that I can say about um, our concepts as human beings, to me, is that it is impossible for us to think with anything other than an earthly perspective of life, a small mind. I mean, it's impossible for us to think like God thinks. Uh, all of our lives are associated with time, past, present, and future. It's associated with uh, events that happen, and most of those events are wrapped around our pleasure, our happiness, our delight, or some tragic thing that happens to us. Our minds just work that way. We, we, we don't know how to think of heaven in, as being a place where the only thing that will matter to us is our worship and praise and adoration of the Lamb of God, and that life will not be about relationships between each other, even though I think we will know each other, and I think we will have some dealings with each other. And, 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 and I'm not saying we won't enjoy being in the presence of each other, but, but our ultimate joy and delight will be the presence of God, the presence of the Lamb. And our days will be occupied with those events rather than anything that our earthly mind can think of. You know, it's just, but, but it's impossible for us to think like that yet. But that's why we see through a glass darkly. Yeah, we will definitely be. Right. Right, yeah. Certainly, and, and we certainly will be. And, and that mindset will be, uh, well, as a matter of fact, there are two things that, that, that these, we'll see it in just a few minutes. There are two, there are two activities that we're going to be doing in heaven for sure. Two things that we definitely are going to be doing in heaven. Uh, let's just read on. Let's go on. All right. Then he who sat on the throne said, this is God speaking, Behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, Write, for these words are faithful and true. I mean, it's almost like John gets distracted and quits writing. 
<laughs> and I was like, uh, uh, he said, right, right, it's faithful and true. And the reason it's faithful and true is because these are God's words. These are not John's words. These are not some angel's words. These are God's words. He said, right, because I'm, I'm telling you something. I'm telling you that which is faithful and true. And he said to me, it is done. Now, it's not done yet, but when he says it, it's, it means it's, it's as good as done. I mean, it's, we can count on it. We can guarantee it. I mean, we're still waiting for all of this to be actually done. Uh, but because he said it, it means it's done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first letter of the Greek alphabet and the last letter of the Greek alphabet, the beginning and the end. And I will give of the fountain of life I will give of the fountain of water of life freely to him who thirsts. So that's just a promise about feel, filling the, the, the uh, needs and the desires of our life. He who overcomes shall inherit all things. What he's talking about is those who have received Christ. If you allow the Holy Spirit to make, create, to make you an overcomer, overcomers are people who have received Christ. And if you've allowed the Holy Spirit to make you an overcomer, uh, you'll inherit all things. And I will be his God and he shall be my son. Personal, uh, personal time with God. Um, we'll enter these responsibilities. We will inherit things and, and, and we'll administer things. In other words, there will be some activity. This is not where it talks about the two things we'll do. But just to give you an idea, you know, he says, if you've allowed the Holy Spirit to make you an overcomer, and if, if you're in the Lamb's book of life, <laughs> you have allowed the Holy Spirit to make you an overcomer. Then you're going to inherit some things. And that means we're going to have some responsibility uh, for some things. I don't know what we're going to inherit. I don't know what, that, what, what we might have there. That, but, we're, but it says we're going to inherit all things. And uh, we're going to have this personal relationship with God. But the cowardly, now he's going to describe all those people that made all the cities of the earth the hell holes they were. But the cowardly, the unbelieving, the abominable, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. You remember the first death, right? The first death is the death we all die. All of us are going to die, most likely. I know everybody thinks they're going to be here when Jesus comes back, and, you know, and they're not going to die. They're going to be just taken right up into heaven without dying. But Paul thought that, and John thought that, and every generation that's ever lived since Jesus left here has thought that. And I think the Holy Spirit puts that thought in our mind. I'm, it's a certain amount of purity that goes with thinking that, right? I mean, if you believe that Jesus could come at any moment and, and take you off this earth, it helps us to have an, anticip an anticipation of the fact that he might catch us doing something. I mean, you know, it's almost like, well, I don't I think I better do that because Jesus might come catch me right in the middle of that act. And it's a purifying thought. It's, a, it's an accountability issue. And if you say you don't care, then you're crazy, you know, or, or something wrong with you. But, but anyway, uh, notice the list there of everybody that's going to be on the outside. Uh, terrible people. These are horrible people. These are the Hitlers of the world, the Mussolinis of the world, the Lenins of the world, the Saddams of the world, the, the reprobates of the world, the serial killers, the murderers, the, ch the child molesters. The abusers of mankind, idolaters, liars, they're going to all be there. And, and look at that second one up there, the unbelievers. I mean, it, 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 it's like with all of these horrible people that certainly deserve to be there, we got this little simple group of people. They're not horrible. They're not murderers. They're not cowards. They're not sexually immoral. They just simply don't believe. Now, that's a, that's a sobering kind of a thought right there, that mixed in with all of those horrible things are just simple people that don't believe. But when you think about it, unbelief is like the father of all sin, right? I mean, without unbelief is like the first problem we have that leads us to all of these. Other, it's like unbelief is, is the one who takes the 
the chain off the nail and opens the gate up, you know, for all of these other things to be introduced in our life. But that's going to be, and the first death is the death that we all die when we die on this earth. And then we're resurrected and we're alive again and we never face another death. We're the, we're, we're, we, this, we are the first resurrection, which not first in terms of, of order because, you know, Christ has already resurrected, so that was the first one. And then you've had some other resurrections like Lazarus. We talked about this last week. Like Lazarus was raised, and that guy that was dead and got thrown on Elijah's bones in the Old Testament, he got, he got raised. And, and the widow's son who was dead and, you know, and she was going down the street crying and encountered Jesus. And she, he said, what, uh, what's going on? What's, what's, what's wrong? And she said, well, my husband died last week, and now my boy's dead, and I've got to go bury him, and I'm alone. And Jesus said, your son's not dead, he's alive. And the boys come back to life, which just basically said, you know, you're not dead till God says so. You know, <laughs> I mean, the doctors say so, and your mama says so, but Jesus hadn't said so. And, and so anyway, the point is, the first resurrection is not first in order of number, it's first of a kind. The first resurrection means these are the first people that have ever been resurrected who will never die again. So it's the first resurrection like that. Everybody else, except for Jesus, obviously. I mean, Lazarus died again, guys. He didn't live forever. <laughs> the guy in the Old Testament, the widow's son, anybody that was resurrected died again. They died like we die. But the first resurrection are all of us who are raptured, and all of the saints of the old, all of the tribulation saints that have been martyred, all, I mean, those are people that died only once. And when they got resurrected, they never died again. The second death are those people that get resurrected only to be cast into hell forever. So they died not only physically, but they die spiritually. The second death is spiritual separation and from God forever. So... These are people that have part in the second death. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls filled with the seven last plagues. Those were some tough angels right there, weren't they? You remember those seven bowls that got poured out? The horrible stuff that got poured out on this earth? Well, one of those guys has finished his assignment. One of those angels had finished his assignment, and he, and he comes back over there to, to John and he came to me and he talked with me saying, come and I'll show you the bride, the lamb's wife. So the angel <laughs> takes him and carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me the great city, the holy city of Jerusalem descending out of heaven from God. So now the city gets associated with the bride. Having the glory of God. Her light was like a most precious stone, like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. By the way, you might wonder, if, if you read this list, and we'll read the whole list, there's some tongue twisters in there. There's a whole bunch of different stones that are going to be described here as, as to the way things look. But one of the things you might notice if you read the list, you might say, well, there's no diamond. Where's the diamond? Because to us, a diamond is the most precious of all these stones. But I, in doing just a tad of research, I found out that diamonds weren't even known about until 1200 A.D. That you never saw diamonds in jewelry or on a crown or anything until 1200 A.D. And so they weren't even known. But this stone sounds like a diamond, doesn't it? Jasper, that's clear as crystal. Uh, most precious stone, like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. So it, it's going to try to now start describing it and all these wonderful things. Also, she had a great and high wall with 12 gates. Heaven has a wall. Can you believe this? Hey, if heaven has a wall, we ought to have a wall. All I'm just saying. Anyway, I knew I'd bring that up. Anyway, heaven has a wall, and it's got 12 gates. And 12 angels at the gates, and the names are written on them, which are the names of the 12 tribes of the children of Israel. So you've got what? Simeon, Judah, Benjamin, Ephraim, Dan, 
Issachar, Manasseh, Asher, Naphtali, and Gad, and Reuben. So you got the 12 boys of Israel, and each one of them has a gate. So there's plenty of gates, right? Three gates, look at them. Three gates on the east, three gates on the west, three gates on the north, three gates on the south. Three gates on every direction of the compass. Now, the wall of the city had 12 foundations, and on them were the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb, which I'm sure Judas would not be on one. It's most likely going to be the apostle Paul. Uh, Paul says, I'm a man born out of due season, you know, and he certainly would become, I think, uh, in, in order to be an apostle, by the way, let me just mention this to you, because we have lots of people claiming to be apostles nowadays. There are no apostles, biblical apostles. Now, I'm not saying an apostle in the general sense of the term. An apostle in the general sense of the term would be like some type of hierarchy leader, like someone over a group of people, someone given charge of a, of a network of people or an association of people, and we're held responsible. That that could be that that is te loosely could be described as an apostle so you can be an apostle nowadays i guess if if you have that if that's what you want to call yourself but you can't be a biblical apostle there are two two things a biblical apostle has to have had one is he had to walk personally with jesus christ that disqualifies most people secondly he had to be personally charged by Jesus Christ himself for his mission. So there's only, I mean, you take away the 12 that were with Jesus when Jesus said, you know, I'm sending you into all the world to preach the gospel, and lo, I'm with you always, even to the end. And those guys were walking with Jesus. And of course, how does Paul qualify? Well, you know, Paul was Saul. And in the book of Acts, it says, Saul says, I was, I was going down the road breathing out threatenings. Like a fire, I mean, he didn't say like a fire-breathing dragon, but that's the picture you get. He said, I was breathing out threatening, like, <laughs> in other words, and, and I had in my charge, I had papers that I could kill the, the, any Christian I found, and I'd loved my job, and I was on my way to do my work. I mean, it was, it was Paul that held, uh, it, it was, uh, let's see, was it Paul that held the coats of the, of the men who stoned Stephen to death? Yes, it was. Paul held the coats of the guys that stoned Deacon Stephen to death. Man, he was, he, was, he was happy to do his job. And he was breathing out threatenings. And then along about a little place, a little wide spot in the road called Tekoa, he gets knocked off the back of his donkey by a flash that was so powerful it just, it just blasted him off the back of his donkey and blinded him. And he looked up. He couldn't see, and he said, Who are you, Lord? And he said, I'm Jesus Christ, whom you persecute. And, well, that ended the persecution. And he said, You go to Straight Street, and I'll have a place prepared for you there. And he's blind as a bat, can't see a thing. And, the, and Saul, the raven maniac Pharisee, becomes the Apostle Paul, sees Jesus face to face, <laughs> only for a flash, and gets commissioned personally by Jesus Christ to spread the gospel. So he's the only one that qualifies. So that's just what I'm saying. So anyway, so here we have gates, and these gates have the names of the tribes of Israel and the 12 apostles, which, which would, would be what? Which would show us what? It would show us that these gates are built on a foundation of truth and righteousness and, and, and the word. And, I mean, in other words, the foundations of this new city of Jerusalem are built on truth and the word and, 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 God, what, and God's, what God's done in this world. The, the 12 apostles, and tw I mean, the 12, the 12 tribes of Israel are what God did in the Old Testament. The 12 apostles what God did in the New Testament. It's God's, God's, God's right, God's ruling in the world. And he who talked with me had a gold reed to measure the city, its gates and its wall. Kind of like a golden yardstick, if you want to you know, picture it that way. The city is laid out as a square. 
its length is as great as its breadth. And he measured the city with the, the reed, and he measured 12,000 furlongs. Its length, its breadth, and height are equal. Yeah, so it's a cube. So it has, it, it, it's three-dimensional. I mean, it's like, it, it, it's as long as it is wide, and it's as wide and long as it is deep. So that, and, and 12... And 12,000 furlongs is uh, 1,500 miles. 1,500 square miles. Yeah, 1,500, 1500 cubic miles. <laughs> cubic miles. So it's as far as New York City to, to Florida, north to south, and from the Mississippi River to the Atlantic Ocean, east to west, and one-eighth of the distance to the moon, up and down. Gigantic city. And, 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 and it's going to be a place. I mean, that's the city of Jerusalem. That's not the new heaven. That's not the new earth. That's just the city of Jerusalem, the new Jerusalem. Yeah, Rick, did you have something? A footnote here. In this okay. Right. It is. I, I, I did some figuring on that, too, and I, I, I started to put that in my notes, but I said, well, that's not really enough. But that's a good, that's a good way to think, 20 billion. It is. It's huge. It's gigantic. I mean, it, it, it sounds, yeah, 20 billion people. Yeah, if only 25%, 20 billion people. I mean, when you're talking about a cubic something, you, you're not talking about square something. You're talking about cubic, which it, I mean, all the levels, you know, are, you, got, you got length and width for every level. It's like, man, it's, it's, it's gigantic, tremendous. And remember, it's got a big wall around. Well, it's got a wall, but the wall's not very big. I mean, compared, compared, yeah, yeah, right. Compared, I know it, it's like a satellite, you know, it's like, you know, yeah, it's like, it's like uh, Independence Day, you know. Is what it's like, you know, yeah, giant, whatever it was, hovering above the earth. I mean, it's like, yeah, like a, like a space satellite station or something. Here comes a city down like that. Now, the wall, and I'll get to it, the wall here is, then he measured the wall. The wall was 144 cubics according to the measure of a man. Oh, oh that is of an angel. So, John, so the angel must have looked like a man, or at least his hand, because John first said, now, according to the length of a man's hand, which is how some biblical measurements were made, like a cubit and a half cubit and all that. So it was the size of a normal man's hand. And John said, according to the size of a man's hand, the wall was 144 cubits. Oh, I, wait, not, not man, angel. Angel what I meant. So John must have got confused, so his hand must have looked like mine or yours. I'm just speculating. What difference does it make? But, but how tall it was is very short in comparison to the height of the city. The height of the city is 1,500 miles high. The side of the wall is, tw is 200 feet. So it's like a little tiny wall. <laughs> you know, in comparison to the city, it's like a little, a little tiny wall. But, but won't nobody be messing with us is all I... <laughs> 72 yards. Yeah, right, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it's, it's tiny, you know, it's tiny. It's a couple hundred feet, 75 yards. I mean, it's just, you know, um, 75 yards is what, uh, 225 feet, roughly. But anyway, point is um, that it's, it, 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 the wall is there, and the, it has foundations and gates and so forth, but obviously the wall's not there to protect anything. Who's, I mean, who's, going, who's there to mess with us? Nobody. And who's there that doesn't deserve to be there? Nobody. So it's just the thought of that. And the construction of its wall. Yeah, do what? And who could? And who could? Yeah, that's right. That's exactly right. Knew every, I mean, it wouldn't, what different, who could? And the construction of the wall was of jasper. That's probably our diamond. And the city was pure gold like clear glass. So the gold was so pure, you could almost see through it. It was just unbelievable. Have you ever thought about how, now, this is just pure thought fantasy. This doesn't have anything to do with anything that's real. But have you ever thought about how we're going to get around up there? I mean, you know, you, it describes street, streets of gold that are so pure, you know, and walls and gates and so forth. And there's a new heaven and there's a new earth and there's a new Jerusalem. So it's like a, 
you know, it's like an association of, of, of places to be and things to go. And um, I, the only thing I can imagine is that, that, that we'll have bodies of light or, you know, the glorified bodies will be bodies of light and they'll be able to be anywhere at any moment at any time. You just think, you think, yeah, you think it and you're there, you know. You stand in the middle of a supernova yeah, there it is. You're there, you're there, you're there. It is. I mean, it, it's described in these kind of ways that, and remember now that John is doing his very best to describe to us something that is beyond our understanding. He's using, he's using the tools of what we know about to try to describe something we don't know about, and we probably couldn't even, I mean, he's just doing the best he can to make it understandable to us. He says it's like pure gold, you know, that you can that you could see like gold, like clear glass. The foundations of the wall of the city were adorned with all kinds of precious stones. The first foundation was jasper. That's probably, like I said, our diamond. I mean, all of, a lot of these stones, we don't know what they were. Some of them we do. The second was sapphire. The third was caldoni. The fourth was emerald. The fifth, sardonyx. The sixth, sardius. The seventh, crystallite. The eighth, beryl. The ninth, topaz. The tenth, Crystallophus. The eleventh, I'm just guessing that. The eleventh is, uh, is Jacinth, and the and the twelfth is Amethyst. <laughs> you know, there you go. I'm good. The twelve gates were twelve pearls. Now I will give you a little insight on or a little thought about this pearl thing. Pearls are the only one of these precious stones that are created by 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 flesh. They're created by oysters, which are irritated or damaged in some way, hurt, harmed, and then it begins to form in them with sand. And, 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 in other words, uh, uh, flesh that has been flesh that has been harmed. Yeah, and it forms right. It forms out of the flesh of its of its body. And notice it had twelve gates that were twelve pearls. Each individual gate was one pearl, and the street of the city was pure gold, like transparent glass. I mean, every gate was just one solid single pearl. But I saw no temple in it. Why wasn't there a temple in it? Don't need one. You don't need a temple. For the, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. Yeah, I mean, a temple, look, a temple would denote a location for God. I mean, a temple would say God is in his temple. And uh, he's, he's isolated to a location, but the, the verse says that, the, the, that, the, that God and Jesus, are, are they, they are the temple. There's no need for a temple because we don't have to go into a holy of holies and we don't need an altar of incense and we don't need an altar to sacrifice anything on. Because uh, God is our temple. We're in the promised land already. That's right. <laughs> this, let's see. That is ten, all right. The city had no need of the sun or the moon to shine in it, for the glory of God illuminated, illuminated it. The Lamb is its light. And the nations of those who are saved shall walk in its light, and the kings of the earth bring their glory and honor into it. Its gates shall not be shut at all by day. By the way, there shall be no night there. And they shall bring the glory and the honor of the nations into it. I like, I like that. There will be no night there. Yeah. The nations will walk by its light and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it. Right. There's still people Well, most like there. I mean, there have been a, there's a lot of uh, speculation about that. I, I I read several. Right. Right. I I and and this is this is some of the things and I and I studied this. No, no. It it I I did. I looked at it uh, from a lot of different theologians, it, even some of the great from the past theologians that had thoughts about this. And what, 
the, the conclusion that made the most sense to me was that um, in, describing, in describing groups of, of people, that in heaven they're going to be, they're going to be, they're going to be people with responsibilities, and you'll see it. And they're going to be people that are given charge over certain uh, inheritances and certain sections and groups, and that there will be people that live without, outside of the city of Jerusalem. There will be people that live in, in, in the city of Jerusalem. And so there are going to be sections of, of life, and the responsibility for certain sections of life are going to be given to uh, saints that have been faithful over a few things. I'll make you ruler over many. Uh, the last shall be first, and the first shall be last. Those kind of concepts. And that it'll st that'll still be true about heaven. Not only is it true of the millennial kingdom, the thousand-year kingdom on earth, but it's also true of the heavenly of of heaven. And so, when it talks about nations, it's talking about a division of people. Not not nations like we have the nation, the United States, and we have Canada, and we have Great Britain, and we have you know not a nation like that, but a but a nation as being a group of people. It's what is the best explanation I know because I know there's no nations, there's no United States, there's no Canada, there's no lost people, there's no devil, there's no divisions among us, you know, as far as races and groups of people and so forth. And we're in a new heaven and a new earth because the old earth has been destroyed and the whole heaven has been destroyed. And so uh, this is a description to try to help us understand the division of Life has it no as it is up there. You know, some people say, okay, just as an idea, that all of the church, the bride, you know, if you're not in the church, you're not in the bride. I know that sounds weird and it sounds exclusionary, but the bride is clearly defined as the church. The church started in Acts chapter 2 with the first person that received Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior on the day of Pentecost. 3,000 people got saved. And then the next day, 4,000 people got saved. And then it just went on from there. And all the way through the New Testament, people coming to Christ, getting saved. All the way from the time of Jesus until right now, people coming to the Lord, getting saved. At some point in the future, everybody who has come to the Lord and is saved is going to be taken off of this earth. So from... Acts chapter 2, until the rapture, that's the church. The church does not include the Old Testament saints who believed and it was counted unto them as righteousness, like Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, uh, all of that group that's listed in Hebrews chapter 11, um, all the prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Daniel, Ezekiel, all, all those Old Testament people, they're not part of the church because they were not saved by the blood of Jesus Christ, because the blood of Jesus Christ hadn't even been shed when they, were, when they died. So they were saved looking forward, believing God for something that has not happened yet. We in the church are saved by looking back at something that's already happened and believing by faith that that happened because I wasn't there. None of us were there. So what we believe, we believe by faith that God has preserved us a word, that this word gives us the truth and the reality of what we need to do to be saved. Well, that group of Old Testament saints believed that the promise God made to them that one day a Messiah would come and that he would come from the nation of Israel and that he would die on a cross and he would save us from our sins. And, and it was counted unto them as righteousness. And then you have a group of people that were saved during the tribulation period. And those people that were saved during the tribulation came to, came to Christ believing that Jesus Christ is the only way to God, and they were martyred. They not only believed by faith, but they also gave their life because the beast is going to kill them. The Antichrist is going to wipe them out for the most part. So though they, they, they were the ones that you saw under the altar in heaven that cried out, how long is it going to be before you avenge our innocent blood? So their souls are in heaven with us, but they're not 
part of the elders that are sitting on the 24 thrones. The elders on the 24 thrones have been there a long time, which is us, the church, receive their crowns, receive their rewards. These tribulation saints hadn't received any crowns or any rewards yet. They haven't, they haven't stood before a judgment seat of Christ and received crowns for the righteous life they've had. The Old Testament saints haven't received their crowns and righteousness. So the church is the bride of Christ. Now, all of these people are going to be there. They're going to be in heaven. But they're not part of the bride. So there's been, spe and this, every bit of this is just pure speculation. It, we, we have no idea what this means other than to say, what could it mean? Well, the speculation is that the bride of Christ will occupy the city of the New Jerusalem and that the Old Testament saints will have a place where they'll be outside the gates of the city and the tribulation martyrs will have their place outside the city. And it's all heaven, so it's not like, okay, we get good and they get ripped off. But there will be distinctions because of the way we came to Christ. And see, that's what makes like Hebrews chapter 11 where it talks about that all of these people believe but they have never received the inheritance of what they're believing for. But we have received it because we have Christ and the Holy Spirit living on the inside of us. See, the, the Old Testament saints had no indwelling Holy Spirit living in them. The tribulation believers had no indwelling Holy Spirit living with them. The Holy Spirit is in heaven. So it's a different kind of deal, but I don't want, I don't want to make it sound like people get shortchanged, but I just want to, to make, it, make you aware that there's the possibility of some distinctions and sections that would be called, and by John would call them, because what would we call them if we didn't know what to call them? What would, how would people understand what you're talking about if they didn't use some kind of earthly language? And our earthly words for, for distinctions are, well, you know, uh, uh, the, the nations. This, this nation and, and this nation and this nation. And so he's describing uh, a distinction there between them. And, 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 that, and that's, to me, that's the best shot at it. So, you know, if you've got, you got other views, we know there won't be any other people there. So can't be anybody, the nations... And, and, and we'll, let's go on and we'll get with, with some more scripture because uh, you'll see some other things here about some things that's, that's said that's going to be in heaven and you're going to go, how? How is that going to be heaven? But there shall be no, no means either, uh, no mean, uh, and there shall by no means enter it anything that defiles or causes an abomination or a lie, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life which is basically us. That ends the 21st chapter. All right, now here we come with chapter 22. He's going to keep on going with all this. Got a few final words to say about it. And he showed me, now this is the angel taking him around. John's been escorted pretty much by an angel the whole time he's been there. Different ones, though. This one now is that guy, remember? This is, well, this is the angel that had one of those seven bowls of wrath. So he's got a new assignment. All right, take the boy around, show him everything, what's going on. And he showed me a pure river of water of life, crystal, clear as crystal, proceeding from the throne of God and of the Lamb. Now, this is quite a different picture than, than the last time we saw the throne, right? What did we see the last time we saw the throne? We saw a bunch of people standing before a great white throne. Now, that great white throne was menacing and fearful. This was a throne of judgment. But for us, notice, it's the throne of life. Coming out of the throne, we're not lightnings and thunderings and fire and destruction, but coming out of the throne was, a, was the water of life, the river of life, if you want to call it that, clear as crystal proceeding from the throne of God. In the middle, now, now this is, see, this is some more descriptions. In the middle of the street and on either side of the river, there was was the tree of life. Now, the tree of life now, now has, there are multiple ones. They're, 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 they're on both sides of the river. So I don't know how many there are. But it, it, it's got, you know, to be on both sides of the river, you've got to have more than one. And 
So we got trees of life. And, and it, you know, in, in, in the Garden of Eden, there was only one. Uh, well, I mean, I say that. I, you know, I say there was only one. Because the, the terms are described, you know, that this tree was in the midst of the garden. And, it, and it's described as a single tree. And it doesn't say trees, plural of life. So we, we, we know we had one in the Garden of Eden. And, and, it, and it, it had some type of fruit on it. And if Adam and Eve had eaten of that fruit, they would have lived forever. That, that's why God had to send a cherubim angel back or a cherubim, seraphim, excuse me, angel back to guard the gates so they couldn't come back into the Garden of Eden once they had eaten the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Because if they had come back and eaten the tree of life, they would have lived forever in that sinful, wicked body that they had. So God had to protect them from eating of the tree of life so they would not be eternally damned to live in a body that was cursed by sin. Now the tree of life now appears in heaven and it's on both sides of the river was the tree of life which bore 12 fruits, each tree yielding its fruit every month. Now there's another little thought that's kind of strange. We got months in heaven. How do we have months in heaven when there's no sun and there's no moon and there's no stars. And we never have any night. There's not a day. It's only days ever. How do, I, yeah, how do we have a month? I mean, beats me. I have no idea how we have a month. But we do. <laughs> and, uh, and, the, and, the 12, and, and the 12 fruits, you know, anticipating 12 months, you know, and of course, uh, how would you know when we had a month? Because you don't have a full moon and you don't have a stars and you don't have any days. It's all day, all the time. But we do, and the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. Now, let me read. I wrote something in your notes that I thought was to me, a good, a good thought about, about this healing of the nations. All right. Um, let, me get, let me get to that part of my note here. All right. Let me find it. What verse are we in? That's verse 2. I thought it was, well, I thought we were past it. John, all right. John sees a wonderful tree or possibly several trees lining both sides of the river. The tree of life. We will have months in heaven, but how? There's no sun, moon, and star. Beats me. All right. The Greek word that is used for healing, when it said that, that, that each tree yielded its fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nation. The Greek word that John uses for healing is the root word of the English word therapy. The leaves of the tree of life provide health-giving power to to the residents of the New Jerusalem. They promote the enjoyment of life throughout eternity. So what I think that's talking about is it's not that we're going to need healing there because there's no sickness, there's no sorrow, there's no death, there's no pain, for all these things have been passed away. So what this is talking about is that the leaves of the tree of life are going to be producing something that's going to make our enjoyment of heaven even greater than it is. It's like, like a therapy, like a, like a spiritual therapy. And it just, it's just the way of trying to say that the leaves on this tree of life give off a powerful something that affects our enjoyment of the whole place that we're in. Uh, I hope the strawberries are all up. I love them. One of them. I hear you. One of them, one of the fruits ought to be a strawberry, that gum. Now, that's just right. Yeah, I see it. That was sort of what, what's, what is the, the new earth? The, the earth is always going to be here. It, it yep. doesn't. There's right. no end of the world. What do you think? I haven't got it from the text, and I've always wondered what. What, what do what you think the earth? earth? Yeah, well, okay, there's the, the Jerusalem, yeah, the, 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 where we're living. Right. What's going to be going on? <laughs> well, the, I should say there there won't be any sea. Now he didn't say there wouldn't be any rivers or creeks or something, but he said ain't no sea gonna be down here. 
I, I think so. I think so. I think, uh, like I said, I, I really think, and I just, just pure my speculation, but I, I think that, that we'll be able to travel to the new earth and the new heaven. What's the new earth going to And it's going to be, it's going to, I think it's going to consist of, of, of paradise. You know, Eden was paradise. There were no thorns, thistle, briars. There were no, um, I, I don't know, I guess there weren't any mosquitoes. I don't know I, I, if they were. They, <laughs> I'm not, I mean, Adam and Eve were naked, so they, you know, I don't know how they kept from being eaten up by them. But, uh, but there, in other words, there was no torture, no torment. The earth was not cursed. Thorns and thistles weren't here. The earth brought, it was a garden of Eden. It was a paradise. And I think that's what earth's going to be, paradise. Yeah, I do. I think it's going to be paradise. Get down there and fish a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. I want to go eat at Waffle House with some of you guys for breakfast. I said, I said, I want to go eat at Waffle House for, for breakfast with some of you guys. You know, if I ever do get retired, which I don't know. I mean, and by retired, I mean retired from my secular work. I'm not. I mean, I'll be doing this until I can't think anymore or whatever, you know. Y'all will be get dragging me off the stage. Say, come on, Pastor, you need to, you need to come on off now, you know. You know, it's time, time for your medicine. <laughs> time for your medicine. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Moses wasn't on the ark, and they didn't, you know. <laughs> but, but if I ever do, man, I want to, we'll, we'll go out to eat some breakfast, and we'll just meander around and, Go look at yard sales and whatever we want to do. Yeah, we can eat we want. That's right, man. Won't you know, get won't get fat. Won't you know? Holy yeah. ghost of God! Sounds sweeter every day. And there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and His servants shall serve Him. Now, there's the first thing that we know we're going to do in heaven, and His servants shall serve Him. So we're going to be serving God in heaven. That's one thing we're going to be doing. And I don't know what that actually would entail, but it, it is a job. And it says we're going to serve him. There, uh, they shall see his face, and his name shall be on their foreheads. There shall be no night there. They need no lamp, nor light, nor sun, for the Lord God gives them light. Here's the second thing we're going to do. And they shall reign forever and ever. So we're going to be reigning in heaven and we're going to be serving God in heaven. So whatever that entails, I don't know what that means. I'm sure it doesn't involve punching a time clock or, you know, that kind of thing, but I'm sure it means something. That means somehow we're going to be reigning with God. Maybe we'll be given responsibility over sections of things. I don't know. You know, maybe maybe Dan will get to manage some wildlife area or something, <laughs> and have a and have a, an, a, an, a, a fishing pole made out of light or something. You know, I don't know. <laughs> Holy Ghost! <laughs> then he said to me, "These words are faithful and true, because they're God's words." And the Lord God of the holy prophets sent His angel to show His servants these things which must shortly take place. Now, of course, you know this was said. 1900 years ago and it still hadn't happened yet you know in daniel in the book of daniel god tells daniel to shut up the words of his prophecy because the time is not yet he said save it for the end times so he said don't 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 write what you saw because i don't want them they don't need to know that it's not time for them to see that yet so shut it up now john he says don't shut it up because these are things which are shortly going to come to pass. So the urgency, I mean, that's the only thing I can say, think. You know, because there's already, there's already been more time between when Revelation was written to now than it was between Daniel and Revelation. There was only about 600 years between Daniel and, Re and the book of Revelation. Now it's been 2,000 years or 1,900 years from 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 Revelation being written till now. So it's been more actual time between them. And yet God told Daniel, don't write this down because I don't, it's not in yet. And yet he told John, don't seal these up because the time is at hand. The time is short. And I, and I think the difference is that, that what God's expressing here is the urgency. I think it's, it's, the, it's the immediacy of 
You got to do what you do. You got to do it now. You can't wait. If you wait, it's going to be too late. You got to get serious. We can't, you can't, you can't piddle around here. This is not something that is way off. It could be at the door at, at, at any moment. And I'll show you what I mean in just a second. Behold, I am coming quickly, he said. Blessed is he who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. The word of right. Now I, John, saw the, and heard these things, and when I, here he goes again. Back in chapter 19, you remember what John did with the angel? He kind of gets beside himself, and he falls down and tries to worship the angel, and the angel says, I, no, no, don't worship me. I'm a servant like you. Worship God. Well, here we go again. John, John mess, falls out. Now I, John, saw, and I heard these things, and when I saw, when I heard and I saw, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel who showed me these things. Then he said to me, see that you do not do that, for I am your fellow servant, and, and of your brethren, the prophets, and of those who keep the words of this book, worship God. Pretty good word from the angel, wasn't it? Pretty good preaching. Because really, you know, for John to fall down and worship an angel would be patently opposed to everything the book of Revelation is about. Everything the book of Revelation is about is worship God. Appreciate God. Love God. And nothing else. And here's John trying to worship an angel. But the, the good thing, or I think one of the worthy things about this to be said about John would be, well, at least he told us about it as a warning and as an example of, hey, look, don't let yourself get too casual here because you can end up doing something that's not right. So bless his heart, you know, at least he has enough grace to tell us, look, I messed up. Let me show you how I messed up. So he tries to worship. Angel says, worship God. And he said to me, do not seal the words of the prophecy of this book for the time is at hand. And then he's going to show us what he's talking about. He who is just... Let him be just, unjust. He who is unjust, let him be unjust. He who is filthy, let him be filthy still. He who is righteous, let him be righteous still. He who is holy, let him be holy still. I think this verse goes with the previous verse where it said, let me back it up, where it says, don't steal the words of this prophecy for the time is at hand. I think Jesus is saying and, and I think the other verse before that was, all, was also in the same vein. And I think what the, the thought here is, look, no one knows when the Lord's coming. He's going to come quickly. He's going to come like a thief in the night. Everything Jesus said and tried to describe his coming, he said, look, he says, you need to be ready. He gave us parables like the five virgins, or the ten virgins. Five of them had oil in their lamps and five of them didn't have oil in their lamps. And when, the, and when the bridegroom came, the ones that had oil in their lamps were able to go with the bridegroom, but the ones that didn't have any oil in their lamps had to try to search around and find oil. And by the time they found any oil, the bridegroom was gone. And then, and, 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 and then two shall be grinding at the mill, he said, and one taken and one will be left. Two working in the field, one will be taken, one will be left. So the urgency of your need to quickly do what you do in response to Christ is, I think, the point he's trying to get across. And he said, look, it, it, it happens so quickly that if you're unjust, you're, you're not going to have time to get just. If you're, if you're filthy, you're not going to have time to get unfilthy. If you're righteous, you're, you're going to be righteous. And if you're holy, you're going to be holy. So you're not going to have enough time to change anything once Christ presents himself. So do what you do now. You don't have another chance. This is too important to take a chance that you're going to miss this because I'm going to come quickly for the time is at hand. Right, just like you are, and you're not going to have time to, to change. Look, man, you know, receive it now. Hear it now. Do it now. Obey it now. Eternity's too long. Hell is sure. Heaven is sweet. Hell is horrible. There's a heaven to gain and a hell to shun. Do what you're going to do quickly. And behold, I'm coming quickly, he says, and my reward is with me to give to everyone according to his work. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Blessed is he. Uh, blessed, blessed are those who do his commandments that they might have the right to the tree of life and they may enter through the gates of the, in the city. 
But outside are dogs and sorcerers and sexually immoral and murderers and idolaters and whoever loves and practices a lie. He's just calling the distinction between the people who have entered into the wonderful joys of heaven and those who have missed it and gone to hell. The people that have entered in are people who have allowed Jesus Christ to change their lives and have eaten of the tree of life. And the people that miss it are, are, the, are dogs and sorcerers and sexually immoral and murderers and idolaters and whoever practice and loves a lie. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David, the bride and the morning star. And the spirit and the bride say, come. And let him who hears say, come. And let him who thirsts come. For whoever desires, let him take of the water of life freely. For I testify to everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book. If anyone adds to these things, God will add to him the plagues that are written in this book. And if anyone takes away from the words of this book, of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life from the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. He who testifies to these things say, Surely I come quickly. Amen. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. The end. Isn't it interesting that the last prayer in the Bible is right there? Look, look. And he who testifies these things say, Surely I come quickly. And here's the last prayer of the Bible. Kind of a sigh almost. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. Amen. For the time is at hand. The beginning of the end. I believe it is too, Danny. That's you know, one, we've, one. We've had the seven years or so of famine. I mean, plenty. I know we've been in the seven years of famine. And I believe Trump is our last president. We're going to have it. You believe he'll be the last president of the United States? He'll yes. be the last one. Well, one. Well, one of these days, and I'm going to tell you, there will be the last one. One of these days. And, and the impetus of revelation is quickly. Things are at hand. And I know that the Lord has given every generation the thoughts that they might be the last generation on earth. But there will be one one day. And our, our responsibility is to prepare ourselves, prepare the people we love, prepare the people that, that can be impacted. Because, I mean, we're not going to be able to, to make people do things that they don't want to do. But we need to offer an opportunity. We need to be the example of what God can do on, on this earth. And the book says, if you'll obey these things, if you'll take these things seriously, if you'll hear what we say, you're going to be blessed by this. It promises a blessing at the beginning, and it promises a blessing at the end for those that hear these words, read these words, and do the things which are written therein. So let's be serious about what God's called us to do. I mean, I, I take it seriously now. I'm going to tell you that. I guarantee you. Rick. earth and the new Jerusalem. Yeah. You know, if that's not enough, you know, to convince somebody, I want to be a part of that. Right. You know what? Right. I mean, besides the, the fear of hell. Right. And the, you know, I mean, but you know, the other side of it, I mean, this is just going to be so, so fantastic. It is. Wow. It's wonderful. So now, Right, right, yeah, right. Even so, that's why I think the last words were, even so come, Lord Jesus, you know, come on quickly. Uh, can you imagine what John, I mean, now John, remember, John is on the Isle of Patmos, a political prisoner, an old man. Uh, birds pecking on him, sea all around him. I mean, he, he has no thought of getting out. Hopefully he wants out, and there's a chance that he would get out, and he did get out, according to history, uh, before he died. But imagine how encouraging those words about heaven and those sights about heaven were to him. And imagine what, I mean, just think about the stuff that he couldn't describe in any way that we could understand what it was talking about. If that was, if, if he did the best he could to describe it in ways that we could understand, imagine what the reality of that is going to really be like. 
Because, you know, when you describe something, you, you're, you're describing it to the best of your ability, but reality is always more than what you can describe. My goodness, it's amazing. So anyway, we look forward to that, and great, great thing, yeah. Right. Well, the unnamed, or you say, yeah. or, or, I mean, I know you Right. And a sin is a sin, regardless of what, what sin it is. Or you or whatever, right. Or sin. But, yeah. but still, it's hard for me to think. Well, here's the thing, seriously, about this. And, and the list that we get in the book of Revelation of murderers, idolaters, sorcerers, uh, that's that's a list to sh to show the 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 evil of wickedness, the 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 degradation of sin. I mean, it, he could have listed any types of sin: disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unwise, you know, uh, abusers, uh, fornicators. Uh, you know, I mean, you could have had it a long. I mean, bunches of lists, and I think that was just a list to illustrate the difference between those whose names are in the book of life and those who aren't, those who are on the outside. Because when we get forgiven, our sin gets covered by the blood of Christ, therefore it's washed away. And, it, and, and, and the Old Testament says that my sin is removed as far as the east is from the west, never to be remembered. And Bertha Smith said, and God posted no fishing sign, which is never ending. In other words, you, you, if he had said north and south, then I would run back into my sin because you can go far enough north that you're back heading south and so forth. But east and west, once you head east, you always head in east. And once you head west, you're always heading west. And so he's telling us that forgiveness from him removes us and makes us as if we had never sinned. As a matter of fact, the word justified means, and, and you can take it and spread it out and, and, and get the definition, Justified means just as if I'd never sinned. Now, that's impossible for us as humans. That's what I'm talking about, this mind. It's impossible for us to say, how can you do that? It is. It, it, it is. It's imputed That's right. It's, it's, it, it, it's like a balanced ledger where I've got all of these debts owed and God comes along and just takes the eraser and just wipes them out. And, and it's as if they never existed. And it's amazing. This, the grace of God, the mercy of God. Yeah, it's what, what you were asking is, like, if somebody was just so rotten, like you take Adolf Hitler, for example, is it impossible for that person to be yeah, redeemed? Yeah. Is that what you yeah, meant? Yeah, yeah. Well, it's hard for me to Well, it, to it's, not, uh, it, it's not impossible. It's highly unlikely. <laughs> yeah, it, it's, it's unlikely depending on, on how far they've gone. But, but they, yeah, I mean, they can be redeemed. I mean, if they really truthfully come to Christ and they actually repent and do what you and I have done, yes. Right. Even, even, even them. Even how horrible the things are they did, they can still be forgiven and Here, go to heaven. Here's a perfect example. The Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul adjudicated over the death of many saints of God. The Apostle Paul uh, actually participated in the death of many saints of God. He, his own description of, him, of his own life said, I was going down the road breathing out threatenings, and I had papers in me, on me from the Roman government that said, you have the right to kill or destroy any Christian you come in contact with. And I love my job. And I love doing what I do. There's a lot of people walking around that are nothing as bad as Adolf Hitler or Jeffrey Dahmer or, you know, these people that we read about. And they still think they're so bad they can't be forgiven. And see, they and, think they're gone. Right. We got to get that. You know, that's something we got to fight against, man. They're, they're being deceived. The enemy's lying to them. And, 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 and they, if they truly come to Christ, and of course, you know, I can't evaluate or judge whether somebody truly comes to Christ. They, yeah. can, say, they can say they did, but whether they really did, I, I don't know. You're only sure about you. Right, right, right you know, and so, uh, but the Bible, you know, teaches us, that, and whosoever will, let him come. 
Uh, but then their life would surely show it. Right. It would, it would be different, their life. And, and see, the repentance of that and, the, and, the, and, and what God would do with, with them that would reflect that and show that. I mean, and, and here's and another example would be uh, the day that Jesus was crucified. There were the, thieves hanging on each side of Jesus. And one of them, and you know, these guys had to be horrible because, I mean, you don't just get crucified for nothing. I mean, crucifixion was the, like the dregs of society, the worst of the worst, the habitual criminals, the reprobates. And one of them said, if you're the son of God, get yourself off the cross and take us with you. And the other one said, shut up. You know, said, we deserve what we got. This man has done nothing. And then he looked at Jesus and he said, Lord, Remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus looked at him and said, Today you'll be with me in paradise. So Jesus in, uh, interpreted and understood that what this guy was saying was, I believe that you're not, they're going to kill you. You're on a cross right now. And things don't look good for you. But I don't believe you're going to stay dead. I believe you're going to come into a kingdom. And when you do, remember me. And that was his way of surrendering to the lordship of Jesus. The Bible says in Romans, in, in Romans 8, no, Romans 10, it says that if we will confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in our heart that God has raised him from the dead, we shall be saved. One unforgivable sin. Unbelief. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah, that. And, 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 it, was, and it, was, it was listed along with all those other horrible things and unbelievers. I mean, you know, and it can be sweet. It could be a sweet granny who crochets baby mittens for all of her grandchildren, but she's an unbeliever. And she's going to be there with those horrible dregs of life. I mean, it could be a sweet person who takes care of their family and pays their bills and, and is a wonderful neighbor and is loving and brings you the casserole over when you get sick, but they're just an unbeliever. Right. To understand what it takes to be saved. And all he has to do. Lying enemy. Yep. All, to, that's the right. Things he tells people and gets them to believe is, he's stealing it. All he has to do is distract you enough where you don't focus on whether you need to believe Christ. I mean, he doesn't have to turn you into a prostitute or a drug addict or a, a murderer or a thief. All he has to do is distract you enough where you never believe. Yeah, I'm, that's good. That's good. Yeah, Lawrence said the greatest trick of the devil is to convince us that he doesn't exist. You know, and that is a trick. <laughs> it is. And or to consider him, you know, this cartoon character that goes around with a little pitchfork trying to cause people to get into mischief. Everybody the other way they? Yeah, I mean. It, it, with horns and a oh, yeah, that's what that's why the, <laughs> in Ephesians, Paul says, put on the whole armor of God that you might withstand against the wiles. W-I-L-E-S is the old King James word of the devil. That word wiles is from, the, is from the Greek word methodia, from which we get our English word method. So Paul says the devil has methods. He has strategies. So you have to put on the whole armor of God that you can stand against the strategies of the devil who has definite strategies to keep you from coming to him. Because although he doesn't know everything, he does listen very well. And when you listen very well, of course, he has an army of demons to, that have assignments. And I'm sure one of their assignments is uh, listen to him and find his weaknesses, find his tendencies. And when we say them, when we live them, they take them down. Go back to Satan and say, hey, if you will do this, this, and he said, so let it be written, so let it be done. And the devil takes advantages of our weaknesses. Uh, what is the name of that movie? Uh, Y'all, I'm going to tell you the name of the movie. Uh, it's, it's, about, it's from the 90s, I think, and it, was, it had Keanu Reeves and, um, and who else in it, Tan? Keanu Reeves, The Devil's Advocate. And what's that guy? Al Pacino. Al Pacino was the devil, and Keanu Reeves was the young lawyer. And that, that right there is the devil. That's the way the devil operates, just like that. See, he didn't make him do anything. If you've ever seen the movie, 
He didn't make him do anything. All he did was offer him choices that, that took advantage of the weaknesses that he had. In other words, he knew that his weakness was pride and ambition. And so he offered him opportunities that would make him well-known, famous, and rich. And all it did when he chose those was ruin his life, destroy his family, destroy him. And, and that's the way the devil works. That's a perfect example of the way the devil works. No. And he, right, because he's not omniscient. No, he's not omniscient. He's not omniscient. Uh, and I know this is a whole different subject. And you guys, if y'all have to leave online, uh, we'll see you. But um, though the devil, the devil is a created being. The devil was an angel. His name was Lucifer. Before he fell, he was the anointed cherub that covered the throne of God. He was the praise leader in heaven. He led the worship. He had a beautiful voice. Isaiah describes his voice. Beautiful are your tabrets. Your, your voice is so, it's the sound of many waters. It's, it's the most gorgeous voice ever been heard. You are a beautiful angel. You were created to be beautiful. And he led the worship around the throne of God. And when he fell, uh, he, he was a, an angel that fell. So angels are, are not omniscient. They don't know everything. They're not omnipresent. They can't be but one place at one time. And they're not omnipotent. They don't have all power. So the devil is not the opposite of God. The devil doesn't even come into the realm of of God at all. He, he's not even a decent enemy because to be a decent enemy, you've got to have virtually the same power. And, uh, and, and he has none of God's power. God can be everywhere. God knows everything. God can do anything. But the only thing he can do is take advantage of our weaknesses and pay attention to what they are and offer us opportunities so that we condemn our own lives, that we curse ourselves. You know, I've said this about my family. And I know y'all have said it about yours, or at least thought it. You can protect them from everything but themselves. You can keep somebody from coming in the house and killing them and attacking them. You can keep somebody from taking advantage of them or molesting them or kidnapping them, but you can't make them make right choices. <laughs>